if you or Lindsay have any um, announcements or anything you need to make. Uh, no announcements. Thank you so much to Lindsay. She really just took the took the reins with this and got it going super quickly. Um, so, and also Shelly and David, thank you so much for volunteering on such short notice to present. I know that this is a really relevant topic and I, and just given the short period of time that we did have to market it, I'm really excited that we're going to be able to record it um, and then offer it on our, the library um, section of the bar's um, webpage. So if anybody, you know, I'm sure that we will all get a lot of information today. So definitely share with, you know, colleagues, friends, let them know that this will be available. So thank you guys so much. I'm really looking forward to it. No, we're happy to be with you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for having me a part of this. All right, um, David, did you want to take it or you want me to take it? Uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, kick this off? All right, so um, I'm Shelly John. I am, if you want to go to the next slide, David, we're going to do, we're talking today about how to work remotely um, in this COVID-19 craziness. And so many people uh, found themselves, you know, a lot of us did a little bit of work from home, but the night that the governor said the businesses had to close, our staff went to the office and grabbed their computers and took them home. Uh, and so it has been quite a transition for a lot of people. And for those people who still run around the courthouse with those really heavy briefcases of paper um, and who still have that odd sounding fax machine in their office, um, my heart goes out to you because I'm sure that this has been uh, quite an interesting transition and a bit of feeling of like you're in the wild west. So we are here today to help you navigate through that um, to teach you best practices. And I'll go through the outline in just a second. So I'm Shelly John. I am a family law practitioner in the Inland Empire. I've got an office in Ontario and one in Riverside. And then I'm set up to work remotely. And so I do a lot of that as well. Um, I've been practicing for 22 years. I also am the president of the East West Family Law Council, and I teach at the Alumni Institute where we teach um, realtors how to do listings and sell the house within the complexities of a divorce case. Um, and then you'll see here, I am the author of a short ebook called Seven Ways to Run Your Practice When Everyone Else is Running Home. And that was birthed at the very outset of the COVID crisis when I knew that a lot of my colleagues were very confused and not quite knowing what's their next step. So I put together a 22 page ebook and somehow it found its way around and Taylor found it and that's how she reached out to me. And uh, we paired up with David. So we're really excited to dig into that. And then David's going to really dig into the security and the best practices. So uh, you'll see me um, running around town on the weekends and in my social media on my mo motorcycle. That's kind of my favorite thing to do besides being here with you folks tonight. So, all right, David, tell us who you are. Thank you, Shelly. Um, so my name is David Shea. I'm the owner and founder of um, Active IT Solutions. I, I actually opened it straight out of high school. I didn't wasn't really a college bound kid and my dad said you have two options you could go to college or you could start a business choose and I, so I picked starting a business with what I loved and what I was good at and uh, so I've been doing that since 2003 uh, since then I've consulted for multiple investigations for the FBI which are, have been fun and super interesting uh, I've consulted for the state of California for Pepsi Edward Jones Sketchers, um, and then a, a ton of small businesses, uh, law firms, medical practices, uh, all over the country, even some that have been international. I'm actually flown international, but I've done a lot of work with um, with companies like out in China and you know our, our best friends over there. Um, other than that, um, I, I play in a country band locally called River Tucky. And I've been married 13 years. So I have two kids, and I didn't write this down, but I'm also super passionate about carpentry and and making things out of wood. So um, yeah, that's me. I'm gonna be uh, kind of uh, tag teaming with uh, Shelly on this topic, and really excited. I, I appreciate you guys joining us this evening, and uh, you know it's gonna be really interesting. There's gonna be a lot of information. We'll open it up for questions here and there, and um, 
you know, I hope this is a excellent resource and um, that you guys get, you know, more than the value of your time out of it. So here we and go. For those, yeah, for those of you who are new to GoToMeeting platform, there is a chat. So if you look up in the upper right side of your screen, there's like a little uh, symbol that looks like a text message symbol and you can put the chat in there. And if you would, there we go. Great, David. And if you would go ahead and make sure that at the bottom it says send to everyone, then everyone will get the benefit of your questions and our answers. So we will tag team monitoring that for you tonight. So we are going to cover how to stay connected to callers, clients, and leads. Um, we obviously, nobody wants to lose business, lose out on business during this period of time. So how do you ensure that you're going to stay connected to those people and stay connected to and nurture your clients through this um, pandemic? How to gain access to your files securely because you don't have your big paper files next to you anymore. And then how to manage those files and also how to manage employees. A lot of people have been hesitant to work remotely or allow their employees to work remotely because they weren't sure how they could manage to ensure that the employees completed their work or weren't taking advantage of them and were not overbilling the attorney for their time. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Ways to appear in cases. So for those courts that are still open or as courts start to open a little bit, not everyone is going to be in a position to run down to the courthouse. Some people will remain immunocompromised and might not be running to court. So we'll talk about that as well. And then of course, everybody's favorite topic on how to get paid. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer, I just wanna say, as to the actual software um, that I use, this is software that I use. David will talk about the security levels of that software and other better options that are out there for security. So I just wanna say a little disclaimer, it's just my personal experience. Um, if you are going to use software, you need to definitely check that software out, make sure that it meets the security parameters that are required, um, and maybe even check with your um, malpractice carrier uh, to see if they have any special rules because it's not just the state bar, uh, you also want to comply with their requirements, which leads us into the next topic, David. Thank you. So we can't just talk about, or we sh why do we wanna talk about the security of working remotely? And I'm going to delve into our requirements and rules set forth by the state bar about that. It's also a great way to build in that ethics MCLE that we all need and want um, when we go to turn in our requirements, our compliance requirements. So let's talk a little bit about the duties and the ethics governing use of technology. So the first one is in our California Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 1.1a, our duty of competence. A lawyer shall not intentionally, recklessly, with gross negligence, or repeatedly fail to perform legal services with competence. So that's going to extend to tech as well. We have a duty of due diligence. Um, California Rules of Professional Conduct, Rule 1.3a. A lawyer shall not, again, intentionally, repeatedly, recklessly, or with gross negligence, fail to act with reasonable diligence in representing a client. We have rules regarding confidential information of a client. This is Rules of Professional Conduct 1.6a. A lawyer shall not reveal information protected from disclosure by the Business and Professions Code, Section 6068, Subdivision E1, and that's an important code section we'll cover, unless the client gives informed consent or the disclosure is permitted by paragraph B of this rule. I do not have paragraph B on this slide because it's not relevant to what we're talking about today, but you can um, find that, of course, online in your code sections. Um, but what we're talking about is just the fact that we're not allowed to re reveal information that's protected from disclosure. Rule 606 AE says, it is the duty of an attorney to do all of the following, to maintain inviolate the confidence and here's the kicker, and at every peril to himself or herself to preserve the secrets of his or her client. Did y'all know that we have to throw ourselves in front of a bus to protect our client's 
confidentiality. So sometimes we think, yeah, we, it's important to know best practices, but when you really take a deeper look at what the ethics require, the code of ethics requires of us, it's a pretty high standard that we have to meet. Also too, don't forget that are your responsibilities, if you are the manager of a law firm or you manage other lawyers or you manage staff, that all of these rules are imposed upon you to ensure that those people are following the rules and that they're all compliant and using tech with competence. In short, a lawyer who has a managerial authority in a law firm, supervision over another lawyer or staff must make reasonable efforts to ensure the firm is compatible with the professional ob obligations of the lawyer or the rules of professional responsibility. So here they're talking about making reasonable efforts and we'll get into that a little bit more. ABA Model Rules of Professional Conduct Rule 1.6. The reason I put this here is because there are comments to this ABA model rule that we want to cover. So we're going to look at the model rule. A lawyer shall not reveal information relating to the representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent, the disclosure is impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation, or the disclosure is permitted by that other paragraph that we're not talking about tonight. And then paragraph C, a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of the client. All right, so here are the comments that are attached for our uh, purposes to that ABA model rule. Paragraph C requires a lawyer to act competently to safeguard information relating to the representation against unauthorized access by third parties. The unauthorized access to, this is the following paragraph, or the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of the information um, related to the representation of a client does not constitute a violation if the lawyer has made reasonable efforts to prevent the access of disclosure. So that's another thing. We want to make sure that we are using reasonable efforts to prevent any of our stuff getting out when we're using all of this tech and working remotely. To speak into that really quickly, Shelley, um, yeah. uh, I deal with a lot of medical offices and I deal with uh, HIPAA compliance. And uh, a lot of what this is, is very, very in line with HIPAA. And what HIPAA requirements require is that you are able to prove and demonstrate that you've made reasonable efforts. Um, so for instance, let's say you get hacked and somebody takes all of your customer information and now you just have this massive leak of, of your client's stuff and um, you know then you have to answer some questions you're like well you know when I use good passwords and I have a backup and I have an antivirus and blah 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 um, you might give all the right answers but if you can't prove it if you don't have that information documented under HIPAA but I mean I the principles apply across the board you're not going to uh, do very well in that conversation. So um, half the battle is actually having best practices. The other half is making sure you, you, you document. It. So just wanted to throw that in there. Excellent. All right, next slide, thanks. All right, in the ABA model rules comments, comment 18, they lay out these factors. And another reason why I'm referring to the ABA model rules is because after the model rules, we're going to talk about an advisory opinion from California State Bar. And in that advisory opinion, they refer to these rules and these factors. So these are the factors to be considered in determining whether a lawyer was reasonable in their efforts to protect their client's information. So they look at the sensitivity of the information, the likelihood of disclosure if additional safeguards are not employed, the cost of employing additional safeguards, and then the difficulty of implementing those safeguards, and the extent to which those safeguards adversely affect the lawyer's ability to represent the client. So if the safeguard is so technical or so difficult that the attorney can't even use it, that will be considered in determining whether it's something that needs to be or should have been used or not. When transmitting a communication that includes information relating to the representation of a client, 
the lawyer must take reasonable precautions to prevent the information from coming into the hands of unintended recipients. The duty does not require the lawyer to use special security measures if the method of communication affords a, what we're used to from law school, right? That reasonable expectation of privacy. Special circumstances though may warrant special precautions. And in the next section, we'll talk a little bit about reasonable expectation of privacy and how is that determined when you're looking at um, electronic um, methods. All right, so the State Bar of California put out a formal opinion back in 2010. There's not a whole lot of opinions that have come out about tech, but um, this one is just as pertinent now as it was then, and they were very smart in how they handled this. So the question that was posed to them is, does an attorney violate the duties of confidentiality and competence uh, that he or she owes to a client by using technology to transmit or store confidential client information when the technology may be susceptible to unauthorized access by third parties. And we're going to see a video that David's going to show us um, about, oh, we're not there yet. My mistake. One back. Yeah, that's okay. We're gonna see a video about um, just how susceptible all of this information really is. And what they said is that it depends on the particular technology and the circumstances. So they didn't get into all of the specific tech that we should be using, um, but they did talk about, again, the considerations that we need to look at when we're using tech. And this case was one where um, the law firm had given the uh, associate attorney a laptop and the software for him to use when working on this particular client. And then that attorney took that computer, worked on public Wi-Fi at, I think it was Starbucks, and then took the computer home and worked on uh, his home uh, wireless uh, internet at, their, at his house. So it was, the question was, is this all, um, does this violate the duty of competence and confidentiality? So you look at six considerations and these are based off of those ABA um, model rule, that comp the comment that we had just looked at. So you're going to look at the level of security with attendant to the use of that technology, including whether reasonable precautions may be taken when using the technology to increase the level of security. Um, the examples that they gave when they were talking about that to break it down is um, you need to be comparing the tech to what we're doing in the non-tech world. So for instance, with email, is email as secure as putting something in the post, which we're all allowed to do. We have to still, in a lot of circumstances, serve by mail. And serving by mail, there has been an uh, understanding that there, is, that there is a reasonable expectation of privacy when you are sending something in the mail. Is there a similar reasonable expectation of privacy when you are sending something via email that is not um, encrypted? And so that's something that you have to look at in the section. And I attached this to your handout. I'm not sure, Lindsay, if they received this particular handout. This is the one I sent you later in the day. And it has all of those rules that we talked about. And it also has the, um, the formal opinion that we're talking about in there. And they talk about how the tech differs from other media like the email. And let me see what they said here. They said that the ABA formal opinion, and there's also an opinion from the LA County Bar, concluding that attorneys do have a reasonable expectation of privacy in email communications, even if unencrypted, despite some risk of interception and disclosure. The LA County Bar found that lawyers are not required to encrypt email containing confidential client information because email poses no greater risk of interception and disclosure than regular mail, phone, or fax. However, the Orange County Bar Association's formal opinion concluded that use of encrypted email is encouraged, but not required. Now, David's gonna talk to us about why we definitely want to encrypt our emails, 
but so you know though what the rule is at this point in time it's not necessary um, that it has to be encrypted but he'll tell you it is absolutely a best practice and i think you'll see in this video um, some other reasons why the other thing that you have to look at is um, that the provider that you're using has reasonable procedures to protect confidential information. So when you're looking at different software that, or you know, you're looking at Google Drive or Dropbox or any of these other systems that we're gonna talk about today, do those providers have security and processes and procedures in place to protect your client's information? And I think David will be talking about what you wanna look for when you're looking at that software and that tech. All right, the next one, the legal ramifications to a third party who intercepts, accesses, or exceeds authorized use of electronic information. And this line item, uh, this factor, is one that goes to whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. And this one looks at the fact that they could be subject to criminal penalties. If they could be subject to criminal penalties for accessing the information from that device or from that method, um, then the courts are saying, well, you may have a reasonable expectation of privacy. If there is no criminal penalty, right? There's no criminal penalty for accessing information through Instagram if you have a public page or through other sources. If there's no um, criminal penalty for it, then you really would consider that there's not a reasonable expectation of privacy. This is not dispositive. It's just a factor that you wanna look at. The next one is the degree of sensitivity of the information. So this is kind of a no-brainer. The more sensitive your information, um, the, lower of, the lower risk you wanna take in putting it some, somewhere or using a service that isn't solely secure. You know, that goes back to you know, delivering something in hand, in the handcuffed briefcase, in person, you know, how sensitive is that information compared to something that you would feel comfortable sending over the internet? All right, the next factor is the possible impact on the client of an inadvertent disclosure of privileged or confidential information or work product. So what they want you to consider here when you're looking at it is not just the financial impact of disclosure because um, there may not be a financial uh, impact if a certain type of information is disclosed. Maybe um, some, your client's affair is disclosed. Well, that might not cost them money in a no-fault state, let's say, but it could cause them severe embarrassment if that information were to get out. Um, and so you want to look at all of the impacts that your client would be faced with if that information was um, stolen or somehow inadvertently got out. Number five, the urgency of this situation. So you're going to look at whether it's reasonable to use this tech or not. Uh, one of the issues is how urgent is the situation? So a lot of you have seen rule, emergency rule 12 that just came out from the Judicial Council that allows us to use um, electronic service. So we can serve papers electronically. Well, that has been allowed because we are in an urgent emergent situation. So the more urgent the situation, the uh, more liberal they're going to be with whether you were reasonable or not reasonable in using that kind of tech. And then lastly, um, the client's instructions and circumstances such as access to or access by others to the client's devices and communications. So here's one, if the client says that they don't want you to send their documents via email, then you don't send their documents via email. And in fact, in my um, fee agreements, my service agreements, I ask them for specific permission to use the electronic forms that I use. And I get that in writing that they're allowing me to use this tech. So that's uh, a little bit of a, a best practice there. So we're going to incorporate uh, these rules, these ethics rules throughout what we're talking about. And they lay the foundation for why you care. Why do you care about security? Even more just than you wanna make sure that um, 
you know, you're doing it right. That you want to, there's penalties, disbarment, all kinds of crazy stuff that can happen if they were to find that you were not in, that you were not competent or diligent in maintaining your client's privacy. Got through that as fast as I could for you. No, you did great. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, you you jump on this this call with us, and um, you know, with the, the promise that we're going to teach you all about you know working remotely, and then we uh, we uh, do a gotcha with a bunch of IT security. Why is that? And Shelly, you put it perfectly with that. We're just laying the foundation because my my biggest concern with this is I don't want to open up Pandora's box for you guys and show you all this great tech without the clear understanding that when you are opening yourself to the world, the world is open to you. And so we have to have those barriers and that mindset in place. And that's ultimately what IT security is, is it's a state of mind. It's simply an awareness and uh, more so an acceptance that uh, people, their full-time job is to get your information to either be malicious, to do it just because it's funny um, or for personal gain. There's governments out there that their job is to, um, to steal your money, to shut down your business, to, to hurt you. Um, and it doesn't matter how big of a company you are, how small of a practice you have, it could be just you because you may be one person, but what about all of your customers, all your clients? You know, if uh, they get access to you, now they have access to all of your clients. They could exploit your influence and then attack them. And then it goes from one to many. It's also oftentimes indiscriminate. So, um, so we'll jump more into that later. I don't want to get into the weeds with that, but uh, it's just um, the most dangerous thing that you could say is, yeah, it's just me. I mean, nobody's going to go after me. I'm flying under the radar. You're the next person to get hacked if that's what you're saying, because um, that's a dangerous thing to say. Um, the next thing they're saying is that it's actually pretty easy to get hacked. Not only do you not have to try, you could do everything right to the best of your knowledge and the best of your ability. A lot of times it's not even your fault. Um, that you got hacked. It could be somebody else's, but um, having a reasonable understanding and uh, again, the most important thing, just that IT security state of mind is gonna, gonna protect you. Um, so the main types of hacking, I'm not gonna jump into these in detail, uh, but I just wanted to touch on them is hacking remote desktop. So we're gonna be talking about um, how you can remote into your system, remote into your files, get into your computer and um, that's the number one way that um, you know people are actually getting in and attacking you. So if you don't have the proper security precautions in place, then you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, phishing and spear phishing um, are kind of coupled with social engineering in the sense that they send you an email that looks, acts, and feels totally legitimate. You can get an email from the bar association, or it looks like it's from the bar association, asking you to you know, click here and sign up for this and put this password in, and you might just be on autopilot working, you're like, oh, I get this, and you can fill this out, and oh, it's not working, whatever. I'm gonna go back to work, I'll deal with it later, and all of a sudden, somebody who is pretending to be the bar, just as an example, just captured all of your information, none the wiser. And they might not may not even do anything with it for six months. So six months down the road, you know, you're um, you don't even know where it came from or how it happened. Security. We have, I mean, huh? and it's not uncommon that we one of our local experts um, was uh, the victim of this with a bank. They made it seem like they were her bank, and mm -hmm. they were able to get her password. And it was a bit interesting how they did that. But it can be any one of us can be susceptible to that. Um, and they are so sly now about how they do it. Um, they look, they use all the same icons and the same font and everything. It looks just like your provider. And you have to pay very close attention to make sure that you're sending information to the right person. And David, there are some, um, like, for instance, I'm not sure if you will go into this, but if I am ever contacted and somebody's asking for, um, my social security number, any confidential information about me, I will yeah. tell them that I find out from where they are and I will contact the entity myself. Um, I don't ever give information when somebody calls me, I don't release that information. So yeah. 
you want we to question should do the same with emails, right? So if we get an email that's suspicious, they say um, there is um, a security alert on your bank account and we need to help you through that process right now. You don't respond in that email. You contact the bank, yep. you do that directly through them. You nailed it, Shelly. Um, and you just want to question everything with the email. You want to assume that even from trusted sources that um, that it is fake until it is not. You know, it's uh, guilty until proven innocent. Um, you know, a, a case study on that. I was uh, happened to do forensics on um, on a woman who was purchasing a house. It has nothing to do with you know legal, but um, you know she was purchasing a house and uh, somebody pretended to impersonated her escrow company and set her wiring instructions that she was expecting because. Um, the escrow company was actually compromised. They were following the email chains. And they're like, cool, this is the time to send our wiring instructions as this company. This woman sent her life savings of $189,000 and it's gone forever. She didn't uh, even realize it until four days later when she didn't get her uh, her papers. She reaches out to the escrow company and says, hey, I wired the money. And they're like, um, what? We haven't even sent the wiring instructions. Yeah. Um, so it's nothing it's just guilty until proven innocent all the time it's obnoxious but it's just the world we live in um that actually was spoofing number six where they were impersonating somebody's email that's what spoofing is and then key loggers viruses trojans that's getting something on your system that is uh, allowing somebody to have access to your keystrokes or even to gain access into viewing your monitor and taking pictures of you without you knowing it and again, that has happened to at least two attorneys that I know in small firms. I mean, not big firms, uh, the, the kind of people who would say, oh, it's just me. Um, they have gotten in and frozen their systems so that they couldn't access their information. I just dealt with somebody yesterday on that exact thing. One guy, um, he, he sold it. He, he knew about us because he owned a company that, that's still our client, uh, but he sold it and then reached out to us as an individual. So he's not even a business owner at this point. He's just a guy with a Gmail account. And, uh, you know, we got everything recovered and taken care of for him. It wasn't catastrophic, but it happens all the time. Trust me. So Shelly's been talking about this video and um, it's, this is going to really kind of put things in perspective for you guys. It's pretty cool. So check it's about it out. seven minutes long. Roughly. It says 11, but very good at his job. <laughs> <laughs> Woo so, now everybody get out there and go online. Yay. <laughs> so now let's actually, now that you guys are, now that we have your attention, um, <laughs> let's actually jump into what you came here for. Um, and so I want to just touch base really quickly on a few terms so that way everybody's on the same page and I don't want to speak over anybody's head. And we will have questions. So if there is something that you're not getting or whatever, it's fine. You know, you can um, throw it in the chat and, uh, you know, or, or, you know, when I open it up, you guys can can I uh, go ahead and ask those questions. So voice over IP, it's essentially a phone system with that operates over the internet as opposed to standard phone lines. Um, the cloud is just somebody else's computer that the world has access to. Um, remote desktop or RDP is essentially remote desktop protocol, but for the sake of simplicity, remoting into your computer. RDP is remoting into your computer. Um, Exchange is a business class email system a backup, the definition of a backup is a duplicate copy of your information on a separate device. And by device, I mean a completely different, not connected to, not regularly plugged in, a truly separate device from your computer that remains up to date without human intervention. So if you tell me, yeah, I you know, have a thumb drive and every night I move things over. It's like, yeah, technically that's a backup. But the problem is that human error is a, is a uh, concern. And so that's why that's, that's a David Shea thing without human intervention. Because I've seen backups fail time and time and time again under that system where you do the manual copy. And it turns out you haven't done that in three months. Oops. And so that's why I put that in. Two-factor authentication or 2FA, it's a, a secondary method of authenticating that you are who you say you are. So your password is the first level of authentication and the second level of authentication can be 
you know, a retina scan, it could be a thumbprint, it could be uh, sending a text message to your cell phone, just like our, our banks do, things like that. So that's 2FA, two-factor authentication. And finally, a VPN, it's uh, pretty much a long imaginary network cable that reaches from your home or coffee shop or wherever you're at over to your office. So for a VoIP then, David, a VoIP is, so we're not using telephone lines when you're using a VoIP phone system. Right. But you're just using the internet. Technically, this is VoIP, what we're doing right now. Okay. It's just um, the construct of VoIP specifically, because this is go to meeting, um, but the technology is the same is what I'm saying. But the construct is, you know, you have a phone, you got buttons and all that stuff, but the technology is exactly what we're doing right now. And when you say the cloud is someone else's computer that the world has access to, I mean, we all think of just the cloud as it all just goes into the ethers and it's saved somewhere, like a little vault in the sky. Is that mm -hmm. what you, what, what do you mean by that? I mean that the cloud is a uh, build of people's servers, um, whether it's Google servers or Amazon servers or um, your IT guy server. If, it, if your IT guy set up something for you and you're saving that information onto his server, he is a part of the cloud. The cloud's just kind of a uh, approachable ca catchphrase that gives people broad understanding. So it's actually but, being saved at a real live computer. Yeah, on, it's at somebody's facility. Um, right. And the reason I say the world has access to it is because it's open to you and you're a part of the world. And the only thing that's stopping the, the world from getting in is the level of security that you have. Great. Yeah, good questions. Any other ones that you got, Shelly? I'm trying to ask ones that I think other people would have, so. Yeah. And if, you know, if there's other questions, because we do got to move through this as we're, uh, you know, we have a limited time with you guys, um, we will answer those. And even afterwards, you know, we'll have, you'll have our information. You could always shoot emails to us as well. So don't think that this is the end of it. I think I clicked too far. Okay. Guiding principles. So these are just some overarching principles that I wanted to touch base on. Um, Tim Stoffel, I don't know if you guys remember from economics class in high school or college, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, nothing is free. 98% of the software, it's not effective and it definitely comes at a price. Um, you know, the price is going to be your data, your usage, you know, so like Facebook is free, but they're collecting all of your information. Um, your computer's performance, it may slow down your system and not work very well. Advertisements, you know, the, another phrase for that would be adware, where you install it, but now it's giving you a bunch of advertisements throughout your, um, your computer. Security holes, whether intentional or unintentional. Um, and just substandard quality. You're not going to get the same quality from something that you pay or that you're uh, got for free as what you pay for, for the most part. So you get what you pay for. Um, the next principle is IT security is your responsibility. It's not your IT guy's responsibility. It's not your employee's responsibility. It is not the government's responsibility. It is your responsibility. When I consult with my clients, I'm their IT guy. And yeah, it's my security, it's my responsibility and they're paying me. But at the end of the day, the buck stops with you because they're your customers and it's your data. And so it's your personal responsibility. So when I am coaching and consulting with my customers, um, my job is to educate them and give them all the, uh, all, all the different options that I recommend. And then it's their job to make the decision on how much they want to spend, if they feel comfortable with this, if this meets their business model, et cetera. And based off of those things is how I'm going to implement those solutions for them um, or have their IT guy do it if I'm just on purely consulting basis. Um, and you guys are the ones, we as attorneys, we're the ones who stand before the bar. So it is absolutely our responsibility. Yeah, they're not going to disbar me because they're debar me because I am not an attorney. Um, they won't debar it. Yeah, they're not going to debar me. You can't do it. <laughs> um, and then number three, uh, your IT budget, it really should recommend uh, reflect the value that you place into your practice. I don't mean just, you know, if you were going to sell your practice, how much is it worth? But maybe, maybe that actually is, um, I, I mean, there's no reasonable metric. It just, 
it'd be unreasonable if you're running a multi-million dollar organization and you're uncomfortable with a $200 a month budget or a $2,000 a, a year budget. You know what I mean? So especially this is the cornerstone of your operations. You know, if like you had your key employee, like if that employee left, you would be just toast, right? You get cold sweats even thinking of like this one employee. Oh my God, if they leave, I don't know what I would do, right? They're not even as important as your computer system because that key employee required or relies on your computer system. So just think about that when you're considering how much you should and shouldn't spend. And uh, just, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll get off that. Well, no, it's important because we remember it is our duty to protect our clients' information at our own peril. So it's important. If you don't have an IT budget, you really need to ask yourself why you don't. It just needs to be one of those things that you factor into your expenses anymore. It's part of running a law firm. Right. So let's jump into the, the meat of this. Uh, Shelly, it's all you. All right, how to stay connected to callers, clients, and leads. So this is some of the stuff that I put in that 22 page booklet. Um, I realized that uh, on the eve of this COVID that a lot of my colleagues had, you know, they were still working on paper and pen and they had no idea what tech to use, what software to look at. So I was just sending them in the a general direction to give them some ideas. So that's what we're going through today is some of those ideas and then all of that tempered by the security elements of it. So when you are using your phone at your office and your client calls very easy, no problem, now you're not at your office anymore because the governor kicked you out. So how are you going to stay connected to your phone? Well, the easiest way is to have your telephone provider forward your calls from your office to somebody, your home phone, your secretary's phone, somebody, they can forward it. There are other services that you can use where you and your staff all have access to the calls at the same time. So one of those apps that you can put on your phone is the Sideline app. You can get that for Droid and iPhones and you just use it um, when a call comes in it rings on all the devices that the app is connected to. So if I have my secretary and my paralegal and me, we all see the call come in at the same time. Any one of us can answer it. We can send text messages through there and our clients, um, and we can all see what those messages are. Similar with voicemail. Everybody can pick the voicemail up at the same time. Um, there are other apps, there are other programs. Um, I know Ring Central, I think, also has um, something like that where the call can come in to everybody. You can also hire a live answering service um, like Lawyer Line. That's the one that I use now. I used to use Ruby. This is an off-site receptionist. All the calls go to them. They answer the phone and they treat it as though they are in my office answering the phone and they can send messages to me or they can send the call directly to me or they can say so-and-so's on the phone, do you want me to take a message or put the call through? We can even dictate, so if they call for Steven, they can direct the call directly to him. Um, they want accounting, they can direct the call directly to the person in charge of accounting. Um, these services vary in price and you will want to talk to them about their packages and what are their per minute prices as well. Um, Lawyer Line is associated with Lawyer.com. It's part of that family. Then you have Ring Central, which is another service um, that has a lot of functionality and it can get pricey, but you just look and determine what do you need? You know, how many people are in your phone tree? And then David put this one in, this PCN, which is local to Riverside. What's that, David? Um, they're an answering service. We've used them. They're, they're pretty good. They, uh, they've held uh, the contract. Like if you um, stop at the freeway and pick up the phone at the yellow boxes, that's PCN. So if you're somebody who wants to work with a local company, actually shake somebody's hand in person once this COVID thing's up, um, then um, then yeah, this, uh, then I, I recommend them. They're, they're pretty good. That's great. And, and like Ruby, for instance, they have, they have um, receptionists out here in, on the East Coast, they have receptionists in Australia, 
And so one time their East Coast office for whatever reason was closed and my, my clients were um, being greeted by someone with an Australian accent. Uh, so that was kind of funny happens once in a while, but there's always somebody there to answer your call, answer the calls. All right, so we touched on a voice over IP service for for a moment there, uh, but let's dive into it a little bit closer. So to be clear, I'm talking about hosted voice over IP, meaning that um, the actual service will be hosted by somebody else. It's, you won't have an internal voice over IP uh, computer or server in your facility. Um, what that looks like is you're going to have your phone um, and it's going to um, it, it's going to reach out to the internet and communicate privately over uh, a secure connection to Jive, Vonage, 8x8, Ring Central, whoever you guys are using. Um, the nice thing about that is because it's hosted, once your computer is programmed, um, or not your computer, but it's kind of what it is, but once your um, your phone, your desk phone is programmed, you could literally take that anywhere. And it's a normal phone, you know, it's got the one through zero with the star and pound on it. You can do extensions, you can do everything and actually more than what you can do with a regular system. But for the purpose of this, what makes this such a valuable tool with um, you know social distancing, people having to work from home, et cetera. And even beyond that, you know, if somebody's on medical leave but they want to work from home or um, you know, they're you know, just had a baby and but they need to take calls or whatever. It doesn't matter what the circumstances. Um, you can literally just unplug the phone, take it home with you plug it into your your internet at your house and you're up and running and you you're fully connected to your phone system so your extension 14 you're still going to be extension 14 so Shelly transfer something over to you you're you're good to go the secret is my husband is a paralegal and he works from home 85 90 percent of the time anyway and when somebody calls the office phone because he's uh he has a VoIP they call the office phone, the staff transfer the call to him here at the house while he's in his bunny slippers and mm -hmm. the clients don't know any better. Yeah. And then, you know, um, a big concern that a lot of people have over voice over IP is what if my goes, my internet goes out, then my phones go down. Right. And I mean, that's a really valid, valid concern. And you can mitigate that by uh, getting a failover internet. I, I know like um, through Sprint for like 68 bucks a month, you can get an LTE um, connection so and then set up have your IT guy set up a failover so if your uh, Spectrum or AT&T or whatever you have goes out it'll immediately fail over to the LTE option until that one comes uh, in line uh, but the other thing if you don't want to spend any additional money is that most hosted VoIP services uh, will give you a, an app you could install on your cell phone and you just sign into the app and your phone literally becomes the um, your, your VoIP phone extension and all. Um, we use Jive. We set up most of our customers with Jive. Jive is excellent, but um, Vonage, 8x8, Ring Central, you know, they're all they're all good services. Um, so yeah, I, I if your internet can support it, which is kind of the big Taylor thing. Wants you to to know. Taylor wants yeah. to know what level of internet do you need in order for that to work well? Great question. I was just gonna jump on that and didn't even read your your email, but um, but yeah, um, your internet should be a minimum of. It really depends on how many people are going to be in your office, but if it's two or three, four people, um, I would say a scrape by minimum would be ten megs down. But if you have Spectrum um, with fifty megs down, and, and more so, your upload is going to be important too. I wouldn't do VoIP if you can't get more than three to five megabytes upload. So uh, 10 meg down, three meg up. If you have an organization with 20 people in there, you're really going to need at least 50 to probably 100 um, meg line. Um, when he says meg down, that means how fast the data can be downloaded to the computer and mm -hmm. meg up how fast the information can be uploaded to wherever it needs to go. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. She, she always my translator, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, that's, that's good. So yeah, 
All right, and then another option you have, of course, is to hire a temporary employee or a virtual assistant. Now there are security issues, but there are also companies that vet employees for you, and these employees can work virtually. This goes back to the ethics rule, though, that you have to make sure that anybody under your charge or any uh, other provider that you use, that they have systems in place to manage and maintain your client's confidentiality. But as long as they do, then hiring somebody on a contract basis, on a short-term basis, somebody else who's working from home, those are all options. Locally, we have Apple One is a temporary employment agency. I think, um, oh, there was another one, a legal one that I received an ad from recently. And then there's Upwork, which is also kind of a part of the gig economy. Um, and David had some uh, comments he wanted you to keep in mind that it is a global outsourced community with people from all over the world who are ready and able to work for you, but you do need to be careful because sometimes you can get scammed by them. So David, you were also mentioning they needed to have a strong passport and... Um, yeah, I didn't finish that phrase, did I? <laughs> I guess it doesn't matter too much. You just wanna have it. Oh yeah, two-factor authentication. I believe that they offer that too. Um, I've used Upwork. Upwork has been, you know, an excellent resource for me when it can, it's come to graphic design um, or just, you know, I need something done that's monotonous. I had a, um, I was building a marketing list and um, I had a ton of, a ton of information that I needed turned into an Excel spreadsheet. And I hired a woman out of the Philippines for three bucks an hour. And she worked like 80 hours to compile all of this and um, did a great job. Um, but I personally have also ran into issues with people who ran the clock and made money when they weren't doing anything. So you got to pay attention to these workers. They do screenshots. Um, you need to be very, very, very specific of what you want them to do. Uh, you know, almost like you're building a contract and it's like it needs, needs to be airtight, as you guys would say. Um, and also, and I want to say, you they're not always um, from the Philippines. Like I hired yeah. somebody some paralegal work and she lived in La Habra but mm -hmm. um, I hired her the same way that I could hire somebody from the Philippines and um, and that worked out well she just did project work it was perfect yep yeah and really the job needs to to justify the pay so you get what you pay for if it's going to be paralegal work um, then you, you probably want to hire somebody in the states who's qualified but if you're just doing some data entry and it's just brainless mindless work hire some woman in a third world country that just wants to um, you know support her kids so. all right there we go all right staying connected to callers clients and leads so i do all of my and i've done this for quite a while all of my very initial contact with a potential new client is a phone call first, and then I decide whether uh, it's appropriate for them to come in for an office interview. Now, of course, I'm not doing office interviews. People are very happy um, to do internet, um, Zoom, or video conference meetings. And it's very easy. I don't know if any of you uh, had this was your first time going on GoToMeeting, but it's very easy to get onto these meetings now. Uh, for the participant. Um, and I'll have David talk a little bit about the security. There's been some talk now about Zoom bombing and different things, but what we're doing, we're doing our video conference here through GoToMeeting. Uh, when we talk about what is the new normal going to be, I have no doubt it is going to be a lot more video conferencing and even to the point where some of your clients may demand that you appear uh, by video as opposed to just having a telephone conference with them. So I think it's going to be more popular. Um, and also when you're keeping in touch with your staff and we'll talk about that later, but these types of video meetings and video conferences are a fabulous way to stay in touch with your staff when you're not in the same office. You can do settlement meetings with opposing counsel, so your cases can still be getting settled during this period of time. Um, and then I know that some places for depositions, you can do video depositions, and there are certain requirements for those. Do you want to talk about what's going on with these Zoom bombings and all this stuff? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Um, really, all it is is that Zoom was not offering the ability to password protect a, um, 
uh, conference call and uh, there was some issues with um, people being able to um, get the the links to these conference calls and so people were able to get on and just harass and mess around with the, the people on the calls um, or you know even worse you know if they're talking about something confidential or private get that information so really at the end of the day uh, what you're going to want to do is uh, just make sure that if it's a sensitive topic and you're talking about sensitive things to um, put a password on it whether you're using zoom or go to meeting we don't have a password on this it's not like we're talking about anything incredibly sensitive um, and hopefully they're not you know we're not well zoom's the one having the issues and there is that um, it's kind of a password but that call-in pin that um, is also a level of authentication uh, the other problem with zoom is um, that they were a little disingenuous with the um, with the servers they were using and some of their failover servers were going to china and right now china has not been our best friend and so uh, that's why google and a few other companies have come up publicly and said yeah yeah we're not using zoom right now um, but for the everyday use for your use if you're putting in a password you're going to be fine you also want to use practice management software so back in the day when i used wordperfect before i had practice management software we would keep our client uh their contact information and then every time they called in we'd type a note we'd keep it in the same word perfect or word yeah word perfect document and just keep saving over saving over saving over there are way better solutions to that nowadays um, and that's practice management software i personally use practice panther it um, has all of my clients' contact information, opposing counsel's contact information. Um, I can store documents in there. I can exchange documents with my client. So it has a portal within there where I can communicate with the client, send messages, have um, encrypted and safe email with the client. Uh, I can do billing. Uh, it keeps track of time. It does all the things that you need to have done in your day-to-day -day practice. Um, Amicus Attorney is one that a lot of people know of, Abacus, they've now combined. Clio is another popular one. Rocket Matter is a popular one. Most all of these offer a 30-day free trial that I encourage you to take advantage of and try. Um, I would do one at a time, but I would get a free trial and just use one client. You know, maybe your next new client or one that you already have, just try it and have your staff start to use it and see how it feels, see if it's comfortable. And then if you don't like that one or something's a little clunky, go on and try the next one. And the way that we started incorporating everything is we then, we didn't just go back and load all of our old clients into the software. What we did is we just started inputting new clients. So as a new client came in, we would input them and started using it that way so that it wasn't uh, so overwhelming. There's also project, man and then you, I'll let you, David, I'll go through these real quick and then have you talk about the security aspect of no it. Problem. But there's also project management software. Um, I really like Basecamp where instead of using the portal in my practice management software, um, I use the portal in Basecamp with my clients. It's very easy for them to understand. It's very visual and intuitive. And rather than them picking up the phone all the time, or sending an email and me trying to keep track of that email and find it and what happened with it, everything's in this portal. So I can see every communication that happens between the client and me or the client and my staff in date order, and I can see what they've received. So I'm not calling my staff all the time saying, did the client get this document or that document? So portals are really good for client communication, and also so your staff, everybody knows what's happening in a file. They can't just holler to the, you know, Sally paralegal next to them about what happened. You don't get to overhear the conversations with the other staff and know what's happening. So it's important to have a really good portal for keeping track of what's happening on these client cases. And then fax machines. So you don't have to have the you know that fax machine the old one that made the noise um you can use um like i use metro fax so when somebody sends a fax to me it actually comes to my email so those are great options yep it's a beautiful thing uh with all of these uh you're going to want to uh, pay attention to backing up your data um so never let anybody fully own your data 
um, if you know all of these should have a way for you to export your information not I, I can't speak into any of them but some will have an automatic feature um, some of them won't all of them will have the ability for you to export this information it's just good to give your assistant the job once a month or yourself the job once a month of just going in and doing an export of the practice management the other thing is uh, you're going to want to make sure to um, you're going to want to make sure that you have two-factor authentication enabled in this day and age you just need to have two-factor authentication on everything i mean and it's a pain everything but it's a required pain yeah it's going to save your butt it's going to save your butt mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so yeah that about covers it um fax oh, machine I what I was say. sorry yeah. i forgot mm -hmm. Um, when you contact these companies, like the practice management software companies, one of the questions you will want to ask them is, how easy or difficult is it for me to get to my information if I wanted to switch to a different client, if I wanted to switch to a different uh, service? How mm -hmm. difficult is it for me to get that information and pry and pry and pry to get that answer? because some of them are more difficult than others to export your information. So that's an important point that David just made, is being able to export your info. Um, on the fax side, not all e-fax um, solutions are created equally. Um, what you're gonna wanna consider is one that is, um, that you could just ask them if it's HIPAA compliant, because that's gonna cover all of your bases. Um, but is it gonna be encrypted, essentially. Some um, of the hosted VoIP systems do offer encrypted, some don't. And so that's gonna be something important for you guys to consider as well. Um, on, on the note of HIPAA really quickly, cause I keep mentioning this yeah, and you guys are lawyers, so how does this apply to you? Um, really what will make you under HIPAA is if at any point you are professionally obtaining and um, storing another person's medical records. So for instance, Shelly being in a family, being a family attorney, if she obtained a psych evaluation of somebody and was storing that information, all of a sudden she is actually supposed to be under HIPAA. Cool. Um, All UCI so, attorneys. Yeah. So just a thought, you know, it's kind of spider webbing a little bit. Well, that's an important thought, right? It goes back to do we understand the tech that we're using? How sensitive is the information that we're holding? And that's going to help us decide what kind of and level of tech and security we should be using. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so exchange email. Um, oh, exchange okay. email. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So sorry. I'm just full of interruptions. No. Um, don't forget to give our halfway mark. Oh, I, I'm not. Okay. I'm, after this segment, I'm going to go ahead and, and hit that. So, so exchange email is um, essentially you. You guys have all used email. I'm assuming um, you got the email with. It doesn't matter. And you, of course, you know what email is. Um, exchange email is going to be that on steroids. So, what that's going to do is um, all of your all of your information is going to be consistent across all devices. So whatever you do on your phone is going to be almost instantly on your computer. What you do on your computer will almost be instantly on your phone. It's essentially a cloud-based service. So when you reply to something, it's going to be replied here. Um, there's a lot of beautiful things about that that I'm not necessarily going to get into, but what it does is it creates the ability for you to um, share your information, to share your connection and collaboration with other users, uh, your calendars, you could have shared calendars, you could have your assistant schedule things for you, or you could have your assistant or, you know, other people be able to view when you're going to be in court. So, um, so you don't have to, it takes steps out of your process on uh, being able, uh, on what you need to communicate across the board. It automates a lot of that. Same with contact lists. You can have a universal contact list that people can have access to for both internal use and external. Um, it gives you the ability to encrypt and protect your sensitive information. So um, for instance, if I was gonna send out some say my own let's say i was uh, applying for for a loan i in fact i just did this um and uh, so i was applying for a loan i didn't just make it an attachment and send it out because i'm sending all my financials for the you know past year 
I don't want that just going anywhere. So I actually through my Office 365 account, and you can do this with G Suites also, but um, but I actually encrypted it, password protected it, and made it a, a uh, one-time use, uh, which might be annoying for them, but I just really wanted to make sure that my information was safe, it was going to the right person, and only the right person was gonna have access to that. Um, it's gonna give you better security features, encryption being one of them, but um, traditional email like POP3 and IMAP, um, you may or may not know what that is, and that's okay, but that's Yahoo, for the most part. AOL. Well, no, not necessarily Yahoo and AOL. It's, you know, it's it going to be attached to your domain name. So if you have, you know, ShellyFamilyLaw.com or, or whatever it is, um, you can have it through a POP3 email, which is not Gmail or Yahoo or those kind of things. But the problem with that is when you receive an email, it is only on your computer or it is only on your phone it is only in one place and if your computer crashes you lose everything if you you lose your phone whatever is on there is gone so there's no uh, there's no uh, synchronization between them um, but also you're not going to get that two-factor authentication ability you're not going to be able to have control over employee oversight who's accessing what and when you're not going to get those records uh, you're not going to be able to implement certain security features like if an email recognizes, if my system recognizes that I'm sending out a social security number, that it'll reject it and say this email needs to be encrypted before it can go out. You could do those things with Office 365 and G Suite. You can't do that with other things. And all this stuff is really easy once it's set up. Whoever your IT professional is, um, should be able to do this for you relatively simple or you could just pick up the phone and call Microsoft or Google and you, part of what you're paying for with this is their support also. Um, finally is um, integrating real-time collaboration um, with your staff and with your clients. So you'll, you know, it's more than just email, but you're going to have Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Um, Shelly and I, when we were working on this PowerPoint that you're seeing, uh, we literally were working on it at the same time, I could see what she's doing. I could literally see her typing stuff in and vice versa. How powerful is that? So when you're working remotely and you're not next door to um, to whoever your, you know, your employees are, you two could be literally be collaborating on the same document at the same time. It'll also document all those changes, save the history of those changes. You could see what was done. Um, Imagine doing that with opposing counsel working on a stipulation or working with a client on their declaration and they can see it and you can see it. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I could go on and on and on about just the magic of this system and it would just blow your mind. I was talking to somebody yesterday about this and um, he was like, honestly, Dave, this sounds too good to be true. Like, really, I, I, don't, I don't believe you. Um, I want you to show me. I'm like, Cool. I'll, I'll show you. It's it's an exciting thing. I get giddy thinking about the capabilities that this these systems and that are coming out are giving us. It's amazing. So um, some the security things I already touched on some of this, but it's um, making sure you have two factor authentication enabled. People, this is free. It's a free um, security system, and I'm telling you, nobody does it, and it would save so much heartache. I was just told yesterday that one of my clients, he makes seven, he's a YouTube and a, a YouTube influencer. And uh, he called me yesterday because he got fished and they, um, and they went in and they deleted all of his emails. His entire income was based off of YouTube. He got a check for $7,000 a month off of his YouTube, gone, unrecoverable forever. All he needed to do was enable two-factor authentication. Then if he got fished, somebody got the password, yeah, you don't want that. It's annoying. You got to change your passwords, but they couldn't get in because they, they need a cell phone. So you just do it. Just do it, period. Like after this, if you have any of these services, stop what you're doing and please go do it. Uh, the next one is make sure that uh, personal devices are password protected. That's going to be like your cell phone, your laptop. I know these things are obvious, but um, if you lose your if you lose your device and it's not password protected, and even more important is um, encrypted, your actual hard drive, um, somebody could get in, and if you have a bunch of saved passwords because it's more convenient, and they just hop into your Google Chrome and they have God mode into your life, 
Um, and then finally, you need to set rules for personal identifiable information, PII. That's what I was touching on earlier with the um, with uh, like social security numbers going out. If I try to send an email right now with social security numbers, and um, it you know it's going to kick back and say, hey, this needs to be encrypted. Can I you say more about what two-factor authentication means? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll touch base on that again. It's um, two-factor authentication. It's you need two factors to authenticate. So the first factor is going to be your password. The second factor is going to be a text message to your cell phone. Um, there's actually a, uh, I, I should have put this in here. I apologize. Um, but yes, Taylor, when you're talking about that six digit code that you get. So like Authy, this is, I don't know if you could see this or not, but mm -hmm. here is, um, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that I'm showing you this because at the end of the day, these codes change every 60 seconds. So this 383100 that you're seeing, there's a little time thing coming through. That's going to change every 60 seconds. And that's what makes it, I mean, you could even exploit this. I'm not going to get into this, into that, but um, this is, it's called Authy, A-U-T-H-Y. Google Authenticator is another one. It's pretty easy when you go to your practice management or Google or Office 365 and you enable that feature, it's going to give you a little QR code. You open up your app, you scan it, and you're done. And yeah, Robert, it is like when you log into your bank and they text you a code to your cell phone. That's Bingo. that second, second factor. Yep. All right, moving on. Uh, actually, yeah, moving on to more questions. Let's uh, open it up to questions really quickly. Taylor's got one there. When you set up 2FA, is it really mainly to protect your passwords? No, it has nothing to do with your passwords. It's the second um, piece of the, of the puzzle. So protecting your passwords is going to be having the training to not fall for phishing schemes, um, having strong passwords to begin with so they're not guessed or, or uh, subject to a brute force attack. Um, because you should use the same password for everything, right, David? Yeah, you definitely should do that. <laughs> Don't do that. No, 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 no. But here's the thing. So let's just imagine you have two-factor authentication enabled everywhere, right? And you do use the same password everywhere. Um, if if your password gets compromised, they're not going to be able to get in because they have you, you have two-factor authentication so they can't get in but now that password is compromised because you use the same and password every single place with no variation or alteration to it now you got to go every single place and try to remember every single place that you put this password in and uh, lock those down so i i can get into some uh some tips on how to remember passwords and I, I can get into that a little bit later um, that's a nice handy tool to give them yeah i'd be happy to share it what's the difference between practice management software and project management software and what is the value in having one or both so you probably only need practice management software because in that so you know how you saw the graphic just now of Office 365 and then the Google Suite where you have notes, you have contacts, you have email, you have um, you know, all of those different things, the ability to store documents. Um, all of those happen within 365 and Google Suite in different software, what do you call them? Like in a different software. So right, you have notes in the notes uh, type software, you have contacts in the contacts piece of the software. In a practice management uh, tool, all of those things are right there. So you open your dashboard and you have the notes, you have access to the clients, the contacts, your calendar, everything is right there in that one dashboard. And all of the your client files can be stored in that one dashboard. It also has the portal where you're able to communicate securely with your client in that one um, client tool, what do you call it? Anyway, in that software. So yeah. if you have that, you don't really need um, the project management software, but if you are operating a lot of different, um, so for instance, you can have tasks in practice management software where you have a client, 
And within that client, it says prepare the pleading due on May 4th, and it's assigned to Sally. You can have all of that in your practice management software. Um, what I like to do in my um, project management software is then it's more, it's visual. Right? So I can put on Tuesday, these are all the projects that Sally's going to work on on Tuesday. And I can move them and say on Wednesday, these are all the projects Sally's going to work on. So it's just, it's not necessary at the outset. It's more a matter of preference. If you have practice management software, you're worlds ahead of not having anything. Just start yeah. there. The way we use it is because um, we don't have practice management, but I have what's called a PSA um, where we're able to put in client support tickets and track our time in there. And that'd be the equivalent to a practice management software. But um, Office 365 has for, for free as part of their service, and that's what we use and what I love, um, is, um, some, is some project management software, which I'm going to touch on. And the way I use those is that um, the project management side of it manages kind of the overarching non-client specific duties and tasks. Um, you know, maybe uh, we're going to be doing an internal server, server overhaul of ourself, or um, I just want to have a 30,000 foot view of what's going on in my organization as a whole and who's working on what. And then as yes. you get more granular and dive into it, that's where, you know, you get into the practice management side of it and um, what's going on with this client and uh, where's our notes for this, this client, um, what time did did we place to bill for those kind of things so that's how i use it that's a great explanation it's a difference between having tasks associated with a particular client as opposed to the projects and how are things running in the office totally but again you don't have that any more questions before we move on no rush um anything we'll have more questions at the end and you had a little something to give them Totally. I got kind of a free little gift for you guys at the no, end. No, but right now. Oh, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so um, as proof that you guys attended this, um, I'm giving you half of a, uh, I don't know, you call it some a code that you'll then send over and um, just uh, verifying and confirming that you actually stuck around for this. I haven't seen the, the number drop. So I think all of you guys are with us so far. So thank you. Um, but anyways, the first part of this code is the letter S, S like Sam, Sally, and Susan, S. So that being said, let's, um, let's move on. So gaining access to work remotely. Philly, you want to take this for, you know, kind of how you use this technology, the cloud storage? So the cloud storage is when we moved from paper and i call us paper hyphen less so we're not totally paperless but less paper um we now store everything uh in the cloud and we use dropbox although after talking with david i'm probably going to switch over to google drive um and that's just where everything is stored we can i have access to all of those files here i have access to them on my ipad when i'm in court all my staff has access to them and um, there are different ones. So you've heard of Dropbox, you've heard of iCloud, you've heard of Google Google Drive. There's OneDrive, which is uh, the one I'm sure David loves because it's associated with 365, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and they're just simple, they're easy to use, um, they are generally secure, and they give you access to the data anywhere. So we travel in our motorhome, I was explaining, and you know I have access to all my files there. And when I go to court, if I really need something, I'll take a very small manila folder, like that big, that has the few pages that I need, but I'm not hauling these great big briefcases of files with me everywhere I go. And that has really saved my back and I'm very happy about that. Uh, security considerations. So a lot of these, and including the practice management software, a lot of these things, they are going to try and entice you by saying that um, everything is backed up, that they back everything up. So David, you can tell us why that's not necessarily true or or how it can be better. Yeah, so um, that's the big security. Um, you're gonna see kind of an ongoing theme here of backups and two-factor authentication, so surprise. Um, but uh, 
a lot of people they misunderstand the use of like OneDrive or Dropbox or, or these and they think oh well because it syncs to my computer and it syncs to my cell phone and it syncs here all of a sudden that's a backup because it's in multiple three places um it's not a backup because what you change in one place changes everywhere else so if a staff member um accidentally deletes something or makes a change um or god forbid you get hit with ransomware and it encrypts your entire system it's going to encrypt your cloud drive which is going to encrypt it everywhere else so you want to make sure that that information though it's on the cloud storage drive is is completely backed up on a separate device that has nothing to do with your computer itself um external so hard drive you can access so for instance on dropbox if your staff overwrites a particular document you can access previous versions of the document which is nice because back in the day whenever i would you know have versions i would save it as version one version two version three and now you don't have to do that because you can easily access older versions but we've had colleagues who have had ransomware i had a colleague who had dropbox and was hit with ransomware and his business was pretty much shut down for a few days, even though they were able to uh, pull up an old version. So anything, anything that was saved or backed up by Dropbox prior to this day uh, was still there. They could get to it. It took a lot of time to get to it. And anything that they had done that day, for whatever reason, um, was not saved. So there are limits even to what they what dropbox can do if you're trying to get that back and imagine three days being down i mean well now you can imagine it but you know when everybody's moving and grooving three days of no not having your stuff and it could be longer if you're a big firm it's going to take a lot longer to repopulate everything yeah i mean if your payroll is you know even a ten thousand dollars every two weeks i'm sure it could be more or less but let's just give you a round number of ten thousand dollars every two weeks and um, you lose a week worth of information, that's 5,000 bucks. And that's only your cost. That's not, you know, you have to redo that information um, that you're gonna be billing your client for. So that $5,000 could be marked up to whatever. And um, so, you know, kind of really monetize the value of your data. And you don't want your whole life, your whole business, your whole world, um, being in the hands of this particular corporation, whichever one you choose to use. So you want to have your own backup that you can go to bed safely at night knowing you have it. Yeah. Um, the reason, uh, Taylor brought up a good point of just wondering why you would not want to use Dropbox and why you'd want to move to something like Google Drive or OneDrive. Um, Google Drive and OneDrive are built more for business, where, where Dropbox is built a little bit more for just personal use. So if it's just for your photos of your kids and whatever, use Dropbox. But there's just a lot more security features and a lot more control that you can use over who is accessing what and, and um, you know, how much access that they have. Um, I don't know if, if, I'm sure they do now, but I know that they didn't for a while and I'd be surprised if they don't. If they don't, they need to get on it. Um, but Dropbox didn't have two-factor. I'm going to assume that they do because I want to think the best of them. Um, but there's just not as many features. It's not built for the business demographic is the short answer. And, and they're trying and they're they're getting there. I just, after talking with David, and I, I use both. I have different hands in different pots. Mm -hmm. um, I use both. So it'll be, and I actually kind of like the Google Drive. It's a little easier. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. And um you know, I, I can say absolutely that Dropbox specifically is not HIPAA compliant. Um, I'm using that as kind of a security benchmark because the principles, principles are fairly universal. Um, so that's just another reason is the compliancy aspect. Um, I'm going to save the questions for the end, but keep them coming, okay? Um, let's see. So I touched on two-factor limitations. Um, cloud storage is limited to Word, Excel, photos, music videos, PDFs, etc. You cannot run database software through it. So if you have an on-prem database, let's use QuickBooks as an example. Um, if you put your uh, QuickBooks, um, you, you, can't, you can leave your QuickBooks file inside of the cloud storage and you can open it up as a one-person like just you, like if you only you do the accounting, but if you have multiple people that are accessing it as a like shared database, um, you can't 
use a database file for that real time kind of continuous synchronization across a cloud storage device. You need to have an on-prem server that is built for that. So that's a big limitation is, uh, and it's fine, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, the other one is that you never wanna move, um, let's see, what did I write there? You will never wanna move brackets, not copy your data from the server to the cloud storage repository. Oh, you will want to move, not copy. Yeah. Okay, so so what I'm saying, I'm sorry. What I'm saying there is if if you, um, I, I worded that poorly, but essentially don't just, don't make duplicates of your information from the server. Actually move your data off of the server and onto the cloud storage because we, let's say you got two files, right? And uh, one person comes into the office and they start working normally on the server and they start updating a document on the server. All the while you're working on a completely separate version of that file, they're not gonna synchronize. And so you're gonna have to go back and copy that information off and put it into the other one. Or depending on the software and the file and the amount of information, that may not even be a plausible option it's just going to create a headache so the best thing to do is be all or nothing to one system so if you're going to use this as a tool don't leave duplicates else elsewhere just practice a, a little bit of um, cleanliness with your data don't, when you're um, when you're moving it not copying it what Does so Dave, no uh-uh <laughs> <Not laughs> sorry uh no this is okay so if you are um like explain that a more I'm not understanding. So, let's say you have they an Excel. So let's if I'm say gonna you use... and I work in the office, right? You and I, we work in the same office. We have a server. We have an Excel spreadsheet that we work off of, you and me. And um, this COVID thing happens. I'm like, Shelly, I'm going to go to uh, work at home. You could stay at the office. And you're like, cool, no problem. We're going to use Google Drive. And so you copy that um, file over to Google Drive. I'm like, yes, and I get right to work and I spend several weeks working off of this. Um, and I notice one day, you know what? I'm not seeing Shelly's work on here. What's going on? You, uh, you didn't continue to work off the file that was in Google Drive. You kept working off the server. And now you have three weeks of information on a completely different Excel document than me. And they're segregated. So now we have to differentiate, figure out what you did, figure out what was changed, figure out, it could just become a huge mess. So make so, sure everybody's working off the same file. Yes, exactly. From and the, the best way to do that is to move it, not, and this is assuming you have a backup. So you have a backup, so that way you're not afraid of data loss if something doesn't move right, okay? You got a backup. Um, move, don't copy. Got it, okay. Yep. Cool. All right. Next. Next, remote access. Shelly, you want to talk about uh, the way you use remote access? So this is so remote. So I actually, um, because all of my the programs that I use are in the cloud, um, I don't actually access a desktop at my okay. office. So back okay. in the day, um, before I used everything in the cloud, and I wanted to get something from my work hard drive. I would uh, remote in, but now I, everything's in the cloud, so I just grab it from the cloud and work up there and do my thing. So you can talk about that. And I'm gonna go off for a second to adjust my lighting. No problem, um, priorities. Uh, okay, so um, remote, uh, remote access is gonna be essentially to where you remote into your computer as if you're sitting at your office computer. So you have your office computer, you got it set up just the way you want, you got special programs on there that won't work off of a cloud drive and um, you can't just reach in and you don't want to touch anything, you don't want to move anything, you just want to work the way you work, but you need to be at home um, or you need to you know, fly over you know, to a different country, it doesn't matter, but you're not going to be at the office. Um, where remote access or RDP is going to enable you to do is literally get into that machine and make it as if you're physically there. So you could print, you could access the server, you could open databases. If set up correctly, it could be very simple and easy to use. And it's almost the exact equivalent to sitting at your computer, only you're at home. Um, it also, it's going to give you access to, you know, all of your company data, 
it's going to give you you're going to be able to run your quickbooks or any other on-prem databases because it's literally as if you're sitting there if you've ever had um, a computer tech help you and remote into your system and start clicking around it's the same thing the security security considerations shocker is going to be two-factor authentication yes you can have two-factor authentication with remote desktop so if you use go to my pc or use log me in or even if you use rdp basic rdp you absolutely 100 percent need to have two-factor authentication i'm so serious about this that i won't set up remote desktop for a customer without setting it unless they allow me to put in two-factor i just won't do it i won't open myself or them up to that mess i won't let them pay me to put them in harm's way um, remote desktop hacks are the number one way that ransomware gets spread and everything that i'm talking about is not theoretical it's born in blood every single lesson that i'm talking about was from getting a call from a customer and having to be the doctor that tells them that they got cancer and we can't get anything back from them and their business is dead and so i don't want the same thing for you guys the nice um, thing about yeah. the nice time to use remote access is when your 70 year old parent wants you to show them how to use something on their computer it's nice to build a remote into their computer and mm -hmm. fiddle around yeah Sandwich <laughs> um coupled with two-factor it's actually ideal to use a vpn i, I say that having two-factor in and of itself is sufficient enough but it's not totally um necessary um can you describe vpn that's really important for us especially um like when we're at court we can use the court's internet that's public wi-fi access talk yeah. about a vpn so a vpn stands for virtual private network so um, you want to think of it like a long invisible um, over the internet network cable reaching from wherever you physically are to your office so it literally securely places your computer on a different network allowing you to reach into your server and access information the same way you would if you were physically there that's uh the that's the use of a vpn that um, we're discussing today for remote work but the other way that you guys have commonly heard about this either on radio shows or whatever is um, a vpn for securing you if you're on a public wi-fi like at starbucks or or at the courthouse um, a vpn places you outside of that immediate network and into your own space that's secure and it's virtual and it's handled away from it's kind of difficult to describe without a whiteboard to be honest but um it it segregates you away from what's going on with the rest of that network so it so it protects your internet traffic and your network activity that you're doing from being spied on from packets being captured from um any of that what i recommend doing is don't even use public wi-fi i don't even touch them uh, most cell phones these days you can turn them into a hot spot and i access my internet through here it's the most secure way and i still use a vpn and i still use two-factor authentication because it's um you know brave new world out there the big limitations to remote desktop is going to be your internet speed both where you are and where you're remoting into if either one of those has a poor internet connection, you're, it'll still, for the most part, work. I've worked on some pretty shoddy um, internet connections remotely out of necessity, but you're, for the sake of actual workflow, you're not going to have the best experience. So if you have a bad internet connection, forget this option. You need to get a better internet connection first. Um, we have the other, minutes. huh? Twelve minutes. Um, no, no, we're going to seven ten because we started at five ten. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, but that doesn't matter. We do got to rush through this. Um, the other insecurity thing is this is definitely the most insecure thing. So you want to step into this with fear and trepidation and really make sure you have proper security in place. Um, moving on. Because we're at 27 and we have 46 slides. So <laughs> VPN, we touched on this. Um, the security of this is going to be, um, let's see, if you have a backup, your data will continue. Okay, so if you're VPNing into the system, the cool thing is that you don't have to change anything. You'll have a secure way to both remote in and you can have cloud access because you're reaching into your own server, you know, somebody else's server 
and you'll be able to get all of your information through the um, through the VPN, both as cloud storage and remoting in. You don't have to change your infrastructure. You don't have to copy information over. Nothing changes. Uh, you still want to use uh, two-factor authentication, and uh, you want to make sure that your server is still continuing to back up as it should have been before you needed to do all of this stuff. Uh, the limitations of it is that um, for the VPN, direct file access will be the same thing uh, with cloud storage, of uh, limitation of Word, Excel, photos, whatever, um, and that you, in, depending on the VPN server solution that you use, uh, most are going to require you to have a static IP address, and so that's something that your IT professional can help you set up. Um, Hamachi VPN is a excellent service that um, it's a software VPN, and if you reach out to me directly um, at a later time, I could get into the details of that, but you don't need to get a static IP address if you use that service. Sorry, I'm kind of rushing this a little bit more. Um, ways to, uh, to manage your files and staff. Shelly, this is uh, so one of ahead. the reasons why one of the reasons why a lot of attorneys uh, or just employers in general are not comfortable with their staff working from home is you feel a loss of control over what they're doing. Are you getting the most bang for your buck? And what th the way that you have to do it when they're working from home is it's very project based. And you figure our clients feel the same way, right? They want to make sure they're getting the most bang for their buck with the time that we spend. And so we have to just keep track of it. And that's what you have to have your staff do. It might not necessarily be that they're working a straight eight to four shift. It may be, or eight to five. Um, it may be that you give them and follow up to make sure that these are the projects that they need to get done today. And you feel like you get your value if those projects are getting done. Um, so you want to make sure that you're managing those projects in the software that we talked about but also having a team meeting. Every Monday morning, hop on GoToMeeting, hop on Zoom, and go through like you would do a regular staff conference um, at, at the office. Make sure that those things stay in place. Also be sure that you have a way that the staff can all communicate with each other and with you when you're remote. So that's going to be through any of these uh, softwares that we've talked about. Training yeah. videos. I do a lot of training videos with tech with my staff. So I'll record something. You can record it through Zoom, go to meeting, or just on your own. Like on my Mac, I have a, a screen movie recording. I can record my screen. And then I keep those video recordings in a file called training videos. So the next person that comes along when they need to learn how to use this particular piece of tech, they can find that. It's a really great way. Um, of creating a nice library. Also, keep an open flow of communication with alternatives to email. How frustrating is it when you know that your staff sent you something or you sent something to them and they're spending 10 minutes going through trying to find it in the email? Make sure that you have something in place that makes it easy to access the information. And some of these other software programs that we talked about help with that. Office 365 Teams, and David's gonna talk about that in a second. But also Slack is another one that allows you to have really great communication. And it's not just that everybody has to be on a great big group text. You can have these three employees have their group text, and then you have them and five others in this group text. So it's nice to have different um, rivers of, of communication going through. Facebook Messenger and text messaging are bad alternatives. Again, you don't have the security in those um, programs and also when you're trying to access a history, you're trying to find something, it's very difficult to find information when you're just relying on those um, alternatives. So productive remote staff plus secure and safe remote methods is bullseye. Nailed it. So uh, employee security training, um, that's going to be a big one where there is, um, because you guys are now going to be fragmented and everybody's going to be working um, at their at their houses, it's going to be even more vital. It's always been important, but even more vital that uh, with all these new moving parts that your employees are actually being forced by you, uh, the boss, to um, to to be educated and to learn what they need to to know to you know, protect your company and your clients information because 
since at the end of the day, security is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to make sure your staff is properly trained. Um, so em employees, uh, they need to understand how to identify phishing emails, unsafe websites, protect their portable media and laptops, and email do's and don'ts. And it's not rocket science, and it's actually really easy. Um, my clients, um, you know, we provide them, you know, the employee security training, and there's about 12 of them that they go through, and they take no more than five minutes to, to go through the entire thing, plus a little like three or four point point quiz and then I could provide my client with a report of saying here's who completed it here's who had trouble and here's who didn't even open the email and bother so then they could go and police it so it's up to you to do that um, a lot of compliancy requires employee security training HIPAA being one of them PCI being another one I'm not sure about the bar to be perfectly honest but it's just good practice 90 percent of data breaches are due to human error that means people that weren't properly trained. And even some that are, I'll be honest, I've actually fallen for some of these, uh, they could be really tricky. I didn't give my information out, but I clicked on the on the um, link and I was like, oh, God, you got me. Um, but I mean, so me being a trained professional and trains other people to do this, even I've um, fallen for these. So if if I'm vulnerable, how much more so is somebody who doesn't do this as their career? It's going to improve response to cyber attacks. People are going to recognize and know when they're under attack and what to do. Um, it costs almost nothing. It's a low cost and a very, very high reward. The, the reward is the sky's the limit. Um, we provide all of our clients this for free. So very low cost, super high reward. And finally, just peace of mind for you, your staff, and your clients. You can actually use this as somewhat of an advertising point and make sure your clients understand just how seriously you take the security of their data. Um, secure your uh, your personal devices, BYOD. So, uh, you know, people are working from home, they were using their cell phones, they're using their home computers because you don't necessarily want to buy everyone a laptop and a new computer. Uh, what are some things that they need to do to make sure that their home computer is safe? Um, you know, they need to have the latest security patches. Uh, for our clients, um, till the end of May, we're actually providing our entire security stack to them, which will bring all of their computers up to up to that. So we're not even charging our customers to do this. Um, you know, that's that's my offer to my clients. So I don't know what your IT people offer. I'm not saying to impose the same expectations, but that's how we're doing it for them. Uh, make sure that they have, you know, up-to-date current antivirus that's not free. Um, and have a separate user profile that is separate from the home users and the family. You don't need your uh, your employee's husband or wife and kids, you know, getting on and playing video games and having access to your guys' um, client files. That's not good. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, BYO devices, um, they need to be encrypted, ideally. Um, so that's something you could talk to your IT about. Um, and that's mainly going to be for laptops, but even personal computers, because if you have an unencrypted laptop and it gets stolen, all someone has to do is pull that hard drive out, throw it in their computer, and they have full access, no password necessary. So the encryption prevents that. Um, password policies, this is going to come down to employee training, is um, training your employees for um, what is a good password. The 2020 recommendations for uh, from the FBI is uh, no more uppercase and lowercase, no more special characters, yay, and you can read about the full details in this link, but an example would be a phrase of 15 characters or more, a, I am encouraged to like dancing is cool, including the spaces. Yes, a space is a character. That's going to be significantly more difficult to um, to guess and to brute force attack than using um, you know a more traditional password that's shorter. Also, they're easier to remember. Um, you could also use them as a method for um, for remembering the passwords for everything. Um, so you can say for your banking, for example, you could say, I like money. And um, that can be your password for, you know, I space, like space, money. As, as just, I'm not saying you use that, but I'm saying that's an example. So you can make passwords that are related to the topic and treat it like a sentence instead of a sing singular word. So you um, still want we, us to change the right. password. You, you still want us to change the password for every, not just device, but every software. Yes, 100%, especially the critical ones. Like your email password should not be the same as your practice management, which should not be the same as your bank account. 
Yeah. And um, maybe for social media, if you don't care for it, use the same passwords there. The personal stuff, that's your prerogative. But the business stuff, the money stuff, the client stuff, that's where you really need to put these into practice. Um, Ask some of our family law clients. You don't want to get hacked and no. have somebody break into your social media either. <laughs> yeah, that could be bad. Yeah, reputation. Um, I'm Because we're running out of time, I'm not going to jump into this. Just don't use USB drives for storing sensitive information. Backups is okay. I can get more into why that's bad if we got time at the end. Um, Microsoft Teams, I was going to actually demonstrate this. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to show you Teams, but I was going to show you a lot of other stuff, but we're running out of time. Maybe I'll even, if you guys are interested, shoot me an email afterwards. I'm thinking about doing a webinar dedicated to just this. But this is what Shelly was talking about for keeping people on the same page. This is where you could have secure chat channels for each team members so you can have like your accounting team and your your legal team and uh you know maybe a team that's just on this one case and uh, a team that you know you that's you know in charge of throwing an office party for shelly's birthday um within these teams you can um you can uh, have video chat within them you can uh, connect files to them you can uh, share photos within the just the segregated teams Microsoft Teams, uh, you know, Slack will do all that stu stuff too, but Microsoft Teams, you can actually integrate other aspects like to-do lists, Microsoft Planner, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents into separate tabs within that same channel. So you can keep a very focused, um, focused idea of what's going on for the purpose of that team. Um, it's included for free within Office 365. You don't pay any more. It's, if you already have Office 365, congratulations, you already have these features. If you're with Google, the a good alternative would be Slack. A lot of people actually have Google, but they also have Office 365 because they want it for Word, Excel, PowerPoint, etc. And so then you have the choice between the two. I'm one of those people. Here's a quick bigger picture of Teams. I'm not going to do the shared desktop, but you could see various teams like customer accounts, development, marketing. This one right here has files, so you can you know access you know the PowerPoint and, and the Excel all within this one team thread that's going on here. Uh, you can have a Wikipedia of like of whatever and Planner. I oh, I can't wait to show you Planner. It's so good. Uh, Microsoft To Do. It's essentially a to do list on steroids. Uh, you can have your own to-do list. This can integrate with your Outlook. So if you flag an email, it'll actually show up as a to-do list within your flagged email. So you know to get back to that person. Um, so it integrates really well. You can share to-do lists. So for instance, um, we have uh, shared to-do lists organization-wide within our company. So um, if I throw up a, ta a task for Jasmine, for instance, uh, I can do it straight from my computer and she's going to see everything right there. So I need her to make a phone call to somebody. I can then go back and see that it was accomplished. Microsoft Planner. Um, this right here is a Kanban system. K-A-N-B-A-N. -A -N. Do yourself a favor and do some research on Kanban because it's absolutely magic. Um, let's see. Do I have, I don't have Planner up, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to. I'm gonna do this just really quickly because it's worth it. So we got this. That's reminding me of Trello. Huh? Reminding me of Trello. Kind of, yeah. So it's a project management tool. This is what we were talking about. So here's Microsoft Teams, and I got this demo channel here, and I want to have a Kanban system. So I'm gonna, you know, add a tab for Microsoft Planner. It's gonna let me do it. Yeah. So I'm just gonna make a whatever name. I don't care. Make this full screen for you guys. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, cool. So, you know, add a couple buckets in here. So this, we have to do, we have in progress, and finally we have completed. And let's say that there's a task that's in progress. So we'll just name this task, task. And, um, you know, I'm gonna go into this task and I'm going to assign this to somebody. So I'm gonna assign this to Anthony, for instance. Um, and he gets started on it. Hill Market is in progress. This has to be done immediately, so it's urgent. And the start date, you can do that. I need this done by tomorrow, the 24th. I could put in notes, and I could even say show on the card. So now when Anthony comes in, 
Anthony's go, oh, this is in progress. I know it's urgent, it has to be done tomorrow. Here's our notes that I scribbled in and he's gonna receive this notification and be incredibly confused tomorrow when he comes in and sees that, sees what this is. So this is a really, really quick potpourri view of, I'm just trying to show you the vision. You can put in your to-dos, you can drag these over. So, you know, when somebody takes this, they can put it in progress. When it's done, they can move it over to complete. They could even mark it as complete and it'll disappear. Um, but like if you, you have, yeah. if you're, a, you're in a law in a law firm, if you have several steps that happen in a case, so you have like let's just say a divorce case, and you have your petition has to be filed, and then you have to make sure your disclosures are done, and you want to make sure that then the next step discovery is done out. You can create columns for each mm -hmm. of those things and just move your client along the pipeline and see where they are, what's been done in that yeah. case let's move on that's we got five more minutes sorry. no no that's okay that's okay uh quick pro tip with the onedrive you could actually scan uh documents from your cell phone for free and then you can share those so i know shelly was talking about using this like if you're in court and you get a specific type of document that you need to to send immediately you can take that scan it right there with your phone it does a very clean job and uh, shoot it over to somebody so that's kind of a little pro tip and tell your clients about that function too. Yes. And you can do it on your iPad and iPhone. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yep. Um, backups. Um, we, we touched a lot on backups, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. But um, ultimately, the most important thing, I saw a question here, which I'll address right now, is um, can you make a manual backup on a hard drive or a separate form of backup to provide instant access to the server? Or if the to provide instant access if the server is compromised? Um, I think there's two questions within that question. The first one is, um, can you make a manual backup to a hard drive? Um, you can, should you? No, but if your server was shot and you already had a backup and you needed to just provide instant access, you can move your information onto a hard drive and then plug that into a machine so you can get access to those files quickly. Um, but Really what I wanna spend time on is this section right here, backup versus continuity. Um, backups is keeping your files in a separate storage medium that is um, automatically getting backed up without human intervention. Um, continuity is how quickly can you get back up and running should the worst happen? And uh, the deciding factors will be budget, acceptable downtime and comfort level. So if, if you need to get back in, up and running yesterday, then, um, then you're gonna be you're going to need to accept that you're going to spend more money on your backup than um, if you can wait a day or a week to get back up and running. Because the conversation at this point isn't, you know, should I or can I back up my information? That answer is already solved. The answer is yes. But the big question is, how quickly can I wait before being having me and my staff up and running? And that's a conversation you'll want to have with your IT professional. Wait, this is all you, Sherry. Failure to appear. Uh no problem go to the next slide so i'm not going to spend time on it what we'll do is we have uh, i have a handout that we can email to all of you and we have put down the fax filing phone numbers for each of the counties and the different departments um e-filing is also available in certain uh, courthouses for certain types of documents and we, I talked about the electronic service of documents, that that now is permitted. Emergency Rule 12 from the Judicial Council came down and it said that attorneys are permitted to serve civil pleadings that would ordinarily be served by mail. We can now serve those electronically as long as we confirm the email address if it's another attorney or we get written consent if it is a self-represented party. This only lasts through the emergency and, and 90 days after the state of emergency is uh, declared completed. So that's that sunset 90 days. Um, so the point is we have court call, we have other ways of appearing in court. Unfortunately, San Bernardino does not have uh, all of the tech that certain other uh, counties have. And also that family law definitely does not have the tech that even civil has. But I think that over time that's going to change. But I'll get those phone numbers out to you. Perfect. And ways to get paid, the most important one, 
Yeah, so you can definitely get paid online. You don't have to take a check. If you do get a check, you can deposit it through your phone, through your mobile uh, app on your smartphone. So you can deposit checks that way. You can get paid via Zelle, um, Square, PayPal. You can get paid by sending an invoice through those programs to your client and mm -hmm. into it as well, QuickBooks Online. You can send the invoice through email and they can hit a button within that and then they can pay through a secure site. You can also send them a link to your, let's say PayPal account. Uh, I can send a link and then they can pay that um, through the link. So many ways to get paid now. Also, some of the practice management software has uh, like LawPay, Practice Panther has LawPay, you can pay within that software. So many different opportunities and you're getting all, if you haven't already received it, a copy of these slides, which has all of these different options on there and the websites for you. Yeah, and then also the practice management integrates with a lot of these solutions. So you could actually um, piggyback off of the time entries and the billing that you're doing and um, those will integrate with QuickBooks and Zelle and PayPal. I, I can't speak for each one individually, but the majority of them, if not all of them, have these capabilities. So you can ask them about how to do that. Finally, a free giveaway. We're almost at the end of this. Um, I'm giving each of you guys a free 30 minute IT business phone consultation. There's a uh, web link here that you're that you can um, follow activeitsolutions.com forward slash SB for San Bernardino bar. And um, this right here, it has uh, some quick questions on there to fill out. I'll put together a report, give you a phone call and we can discuss um, and address in a uh, more detailed and specific to you um, we just have a better conversation more specific to you about your IT and your concerns and what you're trying to accomplish, especially right now. Um, David's so that's gonna that. tell me how to use 365. Yeah, and I will, um, you, you guys should have all gotten a copy of uh, this PowerPoint, so this is in there, but I will also um, leave this in the chat. Anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. I know we got a couple of them. Questions? Yeah, they had about remote access. What are the best ones to use and what are the ones to absolutely stay away from? Um, I would absolutely stay away from anyone that's free. Like, and by free, I mean like you, you go online and you, and you do a, a horrible Google search of free ways to remote into my computer. Just don't do that. Don't uh, remote into, um, don't do anything free because you get what you pay for and that's bad. Um, some free ones that are acceptable would be uh, Windows Remote Desktop and uh, VNC, but that comes with a stipulation of a, the VNC must be coupled with a VPN and Remote Desktop must be coupled with two-factor authentication. The company that we use for our clients is Duo, D-U-O dot com. I'll leave that in the chat here, um, but um, those would be the only free ones that are acceptable. Other than that, uh, you have go to my PC, you got log me in, you got a couple of these other ones that are really good. Thank you, Shelly, um, that, are, that are really good. Um, and they all come with two-factor authentication built in. You, your staff, everybody, it's a requirement. You must have two-factor because if they get access to your machine, they're going to destroy your system, promise. Um, let's see, what else do we got? Pop in, yeah. just take unmute yourselves. Yeah, um, I got a few more here. Um, should uh, should each staff member uh, working remotely have a VPN? Um, depending on what you're doing, yes, absolutely. Um, and um, are there any common remote access programs that we should have, oh, we already touched on that. So feel free to unmute yourself or throw something else in the chat. We'll um, give them the rest of their special code. Oh yes, well, it's SB for San Bernardino, so SB. So, um, Shelly, really I, know, I know you're on a little bit of a time budget. I could stick around for a few more minutes if there is anybody else. Otherwise, thank you guys so much for, um, for sticking around. I hope that this was helpful. Yeah, we definitely hope it's helpful. Any feedback is appreciated to either one of us. Um, you can go to the next slide there, David, and it has all of our contact information on it. Um, you can reach out to either one of us, or um, I think you're going to also get an evaluation 
please be sure to fill out those evaluations. It's required by the state bar. And now that these bars are going to some of these online MCLEs, we wanna make sure that everybody um, is compliant. So please be sure to cooperate with your bar association and get them what they need when they ask for it. And you guys are welcome. Are you still there, Taylor or Lindsay? Anything else? Any last um, announcements you guys have for your bar? Or are people taking care of their little ones right now? Everybody's done for the day. Now it's time to change into your nighttime pajamas out of your daytime pajamas. And uh, yeah, we wish the best for all of you. It's a, a tough uh, time. It is the Wild West. A lot of things are changing. Um, your bar is here for you. I know the other bars, we're all here for you. Uh, reach out if anybody has anything that they need or questions. Well, it looks like we're good to go. Thank you guys. And, um, and uh, you know, if you need something, feel you got all our information, feel free to reach out. All right, take care. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. If you were